Hey guys, it's a dividend guy coming at you with another dividend investing video. Hopefully everybody had a great green day at GGD in the market. You know I always wish the best for my viewers and subscribers. Real quick, I just wanted to uh, <laughs> say how thankful I am that we hit 400 subscribers here on the channel. That's phenomenal. I'm super excited. And we also surpassed 25 thousand views which is great which means that we have more views now than i have dollars in the portfolio and originally i thought about matching the uh the amount of views with the amount of dollars in the portfolio but i'm happy i didn't because i couldn't do that right now uh but anyways guys thank you so much for all the support uh if, if you're new here um the family's growing so it's phenomenal but let's jump into the portfolio i just wanted to say thank you because i'm super excited uh let's jump into the overall portfolio now go into the individual holdings and then into the growth stocks as well so for today we're down about 100 bucks for the week we're down 157 the one month mark we're down 348 uh three month mark we're up 788 for the year we are up 1958 and uh, all time since april 13th 2018 we are up 8.94 percent let's go into the individual holdings now starting with realty income a dividend aristocrat uh we have 15 shares market value is 925.20 our average cost is 45.38. 4.15% of the portfolio is in realty income stock. That will be going up because this is in my top five stocks of all time. It does pay monthly and it's real estate. So that's three great reasons for me why I want a bigger portfolio allocation to the stock. Today, we're down 13.35, down about 1.42%. Total, we're up 244.50, up 35.92%. Then we're on to the monthly paying stocks now, or sorry, the uh, the quarterly paying stocks now. Starting off with Altria, a dividend king, 148 shares. I am dividend efficient in the stock. Market value $6,400. Average cost is $4,384. 28.8% of the portfolio is in Altria stock. So here's the thing, guys. I do want that to go down because I don't want to be over exposed to one industry, but at the same time, I'm becoming more of a fan of Warren Buffett's investing philosophy, which is if you understand the company and you can predict the cash flow and you're comfortable with the company, you shouldn't be afraid to hold 15, 20% of your portfolio in one stock because if you really believe in that company and you're bullish on it, then you should have that allocated. That should be reflected in your portfolio because if you love a company more than any other company and you understand it and can analyze it properly, you should have more allocated. There's no reason why you shouldn't make that your biggest position because if it's the one you're the most confident in and you understand it the most, uh, then you should have that as the biggest allocation. But um, I am gonna trim it down. I don't want anything to be more than about 10% or 15% of the portfolio. So today I'm down 2220 on uh, on Altria. Total I'm down about 70 bucks, down about 1.07% today. Um, next is the goal stock is what I'm going to call them from here on out. So Altria is already dividend efficient at 148 shares. Next, the goal for this month is to have Coca-Cola be dividend efficient. But here's the thing. Coca-Cola doesn't pay the same month. So usually it's 147.10. But Coca-Cola doesn't actually pay in January. It's 47.10.12. So it's a little bit different. But that means that I'm able to buy Coca-Cola um, on the for on on uh christmas which i think is going to be a great tradition because i'm such a big fan of the company um, i'm very bullish on coca-cola i love all their products i'm a coca-cola fan so i have no issue with allocating funds to the stock in fact um if i would have my way with it i would have chosen coca-cola to be dividend efficient before Altria, it's just the dividend is, is double for about the same price so i can buy the same amount of shares of Altria. the dividends like twice as much though so it's it's twice as fast to be dividend efficient in Altria. That's why I picked it over Coca-Cola. So Coca-Cola is going to be one of the bigger holdings of my portfolio. Right now it's at 20 shares. Market value is 960 bucks. Average cost is 51.26. 4.31% uh, of the portfolio is in Coca-Cola. That's going to go up. Um, this is going to probably be one of the 10% stocks in the portfolio. Today we're up $1.80, up 0.8%. 
0.19%. Total, we're down $65.30, down 637, but I'm okay with that. Good cost down average opportunity on a phenomenal dividend king that I am a huge fan of. Coca-Cola is my favorite stock of all time. It goes Coca-Cola, AT&T, J&J, then probably Disney, uh, and then Realty Income. So I know I've switched around it, it around a couple times, but Coca-Cola, AT&T, Johnson & Johnson, that, gets, that pays me every single month of the year. Disney is my favorite entertainment company behind Warner, um, but I own that with AT&T. Uh, and then Realty Income pays me every single month, and it's real estate. So next we have FRT, another dividend king. One share, market value is 79 77 average cost is 11340 percent of the portfolios in FRT. This is going to be a decent holding because it's real estate, and I do want real estate to be about 25% of the portfolio um, within the allocations of being a king and an aristocrat, respectively. Um, but this is going to be one of those that I have at a certain percentage, probably dividend efficient, and then I won't add to it anymore. Um, down about two dollars today down 2.43 percent today total we're down 33.63 down about 30 percent on frt but a great cost down average opportunity here and a great value actually uh cutting almost 20 dollars off of my actually cutting 20 dollars off of my total right now for average stock price uh, then we have lows out of the next set of months with a dividend king that just boosted their dividend by nine percent which is phenomenal um, they've boosted their dividend every single year that they've been public. So that's, excuse me, yeah, I think that was what it, either they've paid a dividend every single time, every every um, quarter since they've been on the market, but they have boosted it at least for the past 50 years. So whether they've done it every, every month, or excuse me, every quarter since they've been on the market or every quarter for 50 plus years, either way, it doesn't matter. I'm still owning them. They're a dividend king. Um, I have two shares. Market value is three hundred and forty bucks. Average cost is one hundred dollars and eighty six cents. We're up big on lows. Portfolio uh, about has one point five three percent allocated to lows. Up at nine dollars and ninety cents today. Up about three percent. Total we're up one hundred and forty dollars on two shares. Up about seventy percent on lows. Then we have AT and T, my personal favorite stock for this set of months. <clears throat> 71 shares. We are dividend deficient. The market value is $2,100. Average cost is $3093. Or excuse me, 9.54% of the portfolio is in AT&T. That will be going up because this is the other. This is the gold stock for this set of months. So it's going to be Coca-Cola and AT&T are going to be my gold stocks that I want to be more dividend deficient in to the point that I can buy maybe four or five shares of AT&T. Right now I can buy three. Um, and the reason for that is because then that can be allocated towards something else or I can just keep building it and allocate funds to, to a different stock. But it's it's if it's easy to become dividend deficient in stocks that are less than $4,000 because if you think about it, you get paid four times a year from three separate months, right? So if I'm dividend deficient with Altria and Coca-Cola and then with AT&T and Abvi and then with ExxonMobil and Aflac and I add a stock every single quarter um, every year, I'll be dividend deficient in a lot of companies by the time I retire. Um, and then I don't get, uh, my income isn't stuck with one stock. I get a lot of diversification and I get a lot of passive income due to being efficient. And if there are stocks that I'm less of a fan of, but they're dividend deficient, I can pour them into the ones that I really am a fan of and get them for free with interest dividend payments on my money. So today we're up 426. Total, we're down about $70, down about 3.12%. Um, and AT&T is one of my personal faves, so I don't mind being down. Uh, this stock was at like $38 a share, so anything at about $32 I would buy, but I couldn't buy it for a while, so now that it's cheaper, I want to buy it like a fiend. Next, we have Advi. <coughs> we have 60 shares. I bought this when they did their... Uh, when they did the acquisition and they dropped because they bought another company. Market value is $5,600. Average cost is $7,222. 25% uh, of the portfolio is an AbV stock, down 60 cents today, up $1,300, up 30.22%. Then we have J&J, one of the next set of months, 36912, with Johnson & Johnson. We have two shares. Market value is 300 bucks. Average cost is 135.79. 1.37% of the portfolio is in J&J. Today we're up 48 cents. Total up 33.02, up 12 cents on J&J.
Then on to the next dividend king with 3M. We have two shares, 328.36 is our market value. Average cost is $140.28. 1.47% of the portfolio is in 3M. Today we're up 216, up 0.66%. Total we're up 33.81, up 11.48%. Then another dividend king with Target. We have 10 shares, $1,500 of market value. Uh, average cost is 87.68, 6.85% of the portfolio is in Target, down 140 today, up 650, up 74% on Target. Then Walgreens, we have six shares, market value is 232, um, average cost is 39.92, 1.04% of the portfolio is in Walgreens, that will be going up. I like Walgreens, they're close to dividend king status. And I don't mind sitting and waiting for them to do that because according to my calculations, they should be able to grow the dividend every single year until they hit king status. So I'm not worried about it. Um, today, I'm down $5, down 2.13%. Total, I'm down 7.53, down a measly 3.14%. So a good cost on average opportunity on a quality dividend aristocrat. Then Exxon Mobil. I have 84 shares, market value is 33.6168, average cost is 53.20, portfolio diversity is 15%. Uh, that is a little bit too much allocated to oil, <coughs> but I'll explain that in a minute. We're down 72.24 today, down 2.1%. Total, we're down $1,100 or down almost 25% on ExxonMobil. Now, let me tell you why I'm a fan of ExxonMobil. I like it because it's consistently paid a dividend and increased it for 37 years. So it's past dividend aristocrat status. And the reason I specifically wanted to buy oil is because of the volatility. Now, I did not know that we were going to have an oil crisis. I didn't know that we were going to have a coronavirus. But that only makes me want to buy the stock more. As long as they can keep producing oil, as long as they have a commitment to the dividend, which they have for the past 37 years, um, as long as they keep the dividend where it's at, they don't cut it, I don't mind owning the stock. I'm not planning on selling the stock. If they do cut it, my rule is I have to sell the stock, and I'd probably pour that money into something that can become dividend efficient. It will not pay me as much as Exxon, because Exxon pays me a really pretty penny. Um, it pays me $73 every time that it pays, which is nearly buying two Exxon Mobil every single month, which I'm a fan of. And I could easily get up to two Exxon Mobil when I get back to work, um, and that is a good goal. But I bought Exxon for the volatility in oil because I knew I could capitalize and even if other positions like say the J&J &J or the 3M that are solid solid plays Exxon's a solid company it's just I knew that oil was going to have more volatility than something like J&J &J. so I wanted to play the volatility and use it to my advantage which I have um, I know my average cost is pretty high that's because I got in a car accident I haven't been able to allocate funds and <coughs> I believe in having single stocks be a big portion of your portfolio, as in I don't get nervous when I see 28%. Um, I'm confident in the companies that I buy, but given the circumstances that are out of my control, I do want to pull back a bit on Exxon, but I don't want to sell. So I want to buy, buy other companies that I like um, more than Exxon due to the fact that they won't be as affected by something like a coronavirus, say something like insurance, which brings us to the next stock, which is Aflac. This is my third goal stock of the year, which means that Coca-Cola, AT&T, and Aflac are the only stocks that I will be buying next year. So specifically because I will be dividend deficient with all of these, meaning I'll be able to buy a share of Coca-Cola every time it pays me, I'll be able to share buy another share of AT&T when it pays me, and a share of Aflac. But here's the thing, guys. <coughs> so Altria's money is going to pay for can already pay for two shares of Coca-Cola AbbVie and AT&T already pay for uh, AbbVie pays for two shares and AT&T pays for one uh, and then ExxonMobil can actually buy almost two shares of Aflac and Aflac will be able to buy itself but with extra dividends and cash um, that I will be adding I will be more than dividend efficient so I'll be able to buy three shares of Coca-Cola, excuse me, four shares of uh, Coca-Cola, uh, uh, four shares of AT&T, and then three shares of Aflac guaranteed as long as every company pays the dividend, which I'm confident that they will. So not only will I be adding 
um, dividend deficiency to three stocks. I'm already dividend deficient and using that dividend deficiency to help me become efficient in more stocks, which means my money is just going to keep making me money as long as the dividends come in. So um, with Aflac, I only have one share, but that will change because it's a gold stock. Um, market value is thirty-six forty-five. Average cost is thirty-five seventy-five. So I'm up a little bit on Aflac. Point one six percent of the portfolio is an Aflac, but by the end of the year, I will have over four thousand dollars in the stock, and it will be dividend efficient, and this position will grow itself. So I won't have to worry about it unless I want to allocate more funds, which I might because I really am a big fan of the insurance business. Um, I like the people have. To it literally have to buy it here in America, depending on what company you choose. Um, and people pay their premiums every month. Whether they use the insurance or not, that's why it's kind of a bubble. It's kind of a hedge. Because people only use it when they need it, but odds are they won't. Like, people don't always need to use insurance. Like, here in Iowa, for example, like, we just had, like, hurricane winds hit our house. This is the first time in, like, 15 years that, that we've actually needed to, like, really use the insurance so people pay for it because legally they have to but they don't use it but they ha they need it in case they need to use it so that's why geico and other like met life and, and all state you know you need insurance to protect you from other people so but you pay them regardless it's like your phone bill electricity that's the type of businesses that i want to be involved in and I've done a lot of research on insurance uh, just as a whole, uh, and I think it's a phenomenal investment. So Aflac's going to be a gold stock. Next, we are onto the watch list, which I'll just go through and say whether I'd buy or sell at these prices. Uh, excuse me, if I'd buy at these prices because I can't sell it on the stock. At 4064, definitely buying like it in plat. <coughs> uh, Cisco Systems at 57, definitely buying, almost $30 of upside. I switched Walmart out with Genuine Parts because I like the dividend deficiency a little bit more. Genuine Parts at 94, just enough for me to buy it. PepsiCo at 138, not touching it yet. Kimberly Clark at 156, not not even close. Colgate, I will make an exception because it's a cheaper stock and I can buy about 10 to 15 shares um, and replicate that easily. But since AT&T is going to be my focus, AT&T takes about I think it was three grand. Or I have like three grand on the stock, but Colgate takes like twelve thousand dollars, I think, or something crazy like that, like ten ten k to be dividend efficient. So I'd have to focus nearly a whole year with the amount I'm allocating to the market right now. And I don't have anything against being dividend efficient in Colgate, but if if AT and T takes three k, and Colgate takes, I think it was twelve, I can get dividend efficient four times. For one of coal, four, I can automatically buy four shares of AT&T versus one Colgate stock, and that's gonna three six nine twelve. So I'm gonna make a hundred and twenty dollars versus seventy eight. I'm gonna make a hundred and twenty dollars every three months versus buying it one time in a year. Therefore, I'm gonna be able to buy twelve AT&T before I can buy one Colgate because you every every four AT every four months I can buy. Uh, or every three months, I can buy one AT and T. So three, six, nine, twelve. Within a year, I, I could quadruple what I could do in Colgate. See why it doesn't make sense. I'm going for, when you go for, when you look at it in efficiency, it doesn't make any sense to be dividend efficient in Colgate if AT and T has a better dividend isn't and having a better growth rate, and you're more bullish on the company anyway. So that's what I've been doing is comparing and trying to find the most efficient stock that I actually want to own more of. So AT and T makes way more sense. Same issue with Procter & Gamble. Love the company, but efficiency, this is going to take like $16,000 versus four. So again, four times more efficient. Uh, I'll be four times more efficient with AT&T than I will with Procter & Gamble. And the thing is, <coughs> eventually, the stocks that I get, or the amount of dividends that I get from AT&T will literally cover Procter & Gamble. It makes more sense to be dividend efficient and get paid out to buy a stock that I want with the stock that is cheaper to be efficient in versus waiting a year and a half or a year and three months or whatever to be dividend efficient in Procter and Gamble. Just doesn't make any sense. Um, so, but at this current price at 138, I wouldn't be buying it because it's too high, but I would initiate a position of like two to three shares just because I want it in the portfolio. Then Caterpillar <coughs> at 141, 
I wouldn't buy it. It's $9 of upside, not enough. SX property, I already know. At $300, it's a steal. So at $212, it's uh, kind of irritating. I haven't bought it yet. <laughs> uh, then Clorox, one of my personal favorites um, for the set of months. But I'm not touching it with a 10-foot pole because, oh, well, it's got about $19 of upside. Yeah, about $19 of upside. I'm so used to saying that. It just automatically comes out. Definitely would buy it here. It's uh, got 20 excuse me, almost $20 of upside. Then uh, Black Hills Group, I switched them out for Consolidated Edison because they do gas and electric, not just electric, and uh, they're homegrown. So they actually cover my state, Iowa, um, in the uh, gas sector, I believe. The utilities transmits to South Dakota, Wyoming, Colorado, Montana. Uh, the gas does Arkansas, Colorado, Iowa, Kansas, Nebraska, and Wyoming. So instead of just New York City, I get like a diversification beyond one state i get like 12 and i also get the diversification and the same utility for gas and, and electric versus just electric so i like black hills and it is not technically a dividend diversifier because it's not in the s p uh which is weird so stocks can actually technically be aristocrat status but not have the status due to the lack of inclusion in the s p 500 but black hills has paid a dividend for close to, i think it's 49 years or something crazy so they're really close to king status it's like 47 to 49 years Something I want in my portfolio, obviously. Um, and since it's homegrown, I'd rather have it instead of Consolidated Edison. But I do like Consolidated Edison. I liked the financials. I love the company. I love that it powered one of the most popular cities, New York City, um, in the United States. Uh, but I just would rather have a homegrown utility instead of one that's so far away from me. Then Mickey D's, a no-brainer, a real estate play at 213. Oh, sorry, uh, Black Hills at 54. I'm buying it because 87 is 52 week high, so I have... Uh, about $33 of upside in the stock. Uh, McDonald's at 213 is not enough upside for me to buy it currently. Uh, and these are the, the growth stocks. So Warner Music Group, I've said in multiple videos, they uh, were part of Warner, but they broke off like 15 years ago for some reason. They sold the, the uh, music group assets. But they own the rights to the music of a lot of artists that I really do like listening to, as in... Ed Sheeran and um, Shinedown are both on the <laughs> both on the roster, as well as Skillet, Leonard Skinner, Van Halen, Aha, Cardi B. Uh, they just they have a lot of uh, artists that I think will generate revenue in the future, regardless of if they make new new music. Which is really uh, Nickelback's on there too. Um, I'm not a huge fan, but I know a lot of people stream their music. Um, and my re the reason that I'm so bullish on it is because I could own something like, say, Pandora or, say, um, Spotify, where people go to listen to music there, but they don't own the rights to the music. They actually have to pay for the rights to the music. I'd rather own the company that gets paid versus the company that has to pay. See what I mean? It's like owning... It's like buying Coca-Cola versus owning the Coca-Cola company. I'd rather own Coca-Cola and buy it because I'm a fan of the product. I'm going to listen to Ed Sheeran until the day I die. I love him. I think he's a phenomenal artist. They have uh, some Frank Sinatra and I believe Elton John as well. Um, I don't think he's directly on the roster, but I do know that he signed Ed Sheeran. So he's at least affiliated. Um, and it's, I just get excited when I think that I get to own. Like Ed Sheeran's in my top five artists, fav uh, favorite artists of all time. And Shinedown is my second favorite rock band behind Nirvana. So if I get to own a piece of that, a <coughs> piece of my favorite bands, I'm going to buy it. It's, it's a no-brainer for me. Then we have Disney. <clears throat> I've talked a lot about Disney here on the channel. I've owned the stock. I sold it because it didn't pay a dividend anymore, but this is actually going to be a growth play instead. But everybody loves Disney. Um, my top five Disney movies are Lion King, Tarzan, Oliver, and Company. Aladdin and Jungle Book so I love Disney I, everybody's grown up with them they're a huge multimedia conglomerate um, I love Disney so I definitely will be adding it to the portfolio for the growth stock portion of the portfolio then we have Take-Two Interactive I chose them over Tesla because I love Grand Theft Auto and the other <laughs> games that they offer so one of the big things that's important about investing is you invest in what you like so I'm a huge fan of Coca-Cola. Um, I use their products literally every single day. Procter & Gamble is the same way. <coughs> J&J is the same way. Um, Colgate is the same way. There's certain companies that, whether you know it or not, you use their product every single day. I love Grand Theft Auto. It's, one of, it's probably my favorite game series of all time. 
Um, I've probably, that in Skyrim, um, but I've probably logged more hours in Grand Theft Auto than any other franchise, gaming franchise, period. Um, except maybe the Arkham games, but I own them too. Um, but I like video games. I like Grand Theft Auto. I like the franchises that they own more than any other company. Um, and I like video games. So that's my take on it. I think it's important to invest in things that you love. And I love Take-Two Interactive. I love what they produce. I love the quality that they produce at as well. Uh, next, we have Berkshire Hathaway. So I was going to do Apple, but they own 10% of it. So why not own what owns 10%? Same theory with same ideology behind buy Coca-Cola versus own it. So they own a big stake in Coca-Cola, but I do want Coca-Cola in the portfolio due to the, div due to the dividend income that it it uh, generates for me. But Berkshire Hathaway owns over like 500 businesses or something crazy like that from Gillette to... Uh, I said Coca-Cola, they own Bank of America shares, they own the huge stake in Apple, <clears throat> just so many wonderful companies, and not only do you get the array of companies, you get the smartest investor alive, along with one of the other smartest investors alive being Warren Buffett and Charlie Munger, um, and then their cabinet, the people that they're training to take over for them, are just as smart. They are just as seasoned as Buffett, they've learned under him for years, and I think they will really they will change the way Berkshire invests, which we've seen when they sold the banks. But I think that's okay. I think it's okay for them to shift the way that they invest to keep up with the times. So I love Berkshire Hathaway, and I definitely will buy it as a growth stock. Next, fate to uh, to finish off the um, <coughs> the growth stocks is Facebook. Um, I think that Facebook is a huge um, has a huge um, user base, and their advertising business is phenomenal. Um, only thing I will say, though, is I might switch out Facebook for Google simply because I love Facebook. Um, I love their story. I've done a lot of research on Zuckerberg, how they built Facebook, um, the history behind it. I'm very bullish on the company, but I like Google a little bit more than I like Facebook, and honestly, I'm more comfortable owning the biggest search engine in the world versus the biggest social media website and the biggest social media site in the world because I feel like Facebook might have an end date. I know they have um, apps that they haven't monetized yet, but I feel like Facebook is more likely to go out of style or fall from grace further than Google. So I might switch Facebook for Google. We'll see. Um, I know ad-wise they're they're similar, um, but I could switch them out. So Facebook's not set in stone. Everything else really is. Berkshire Hathaway's definitely staying. Take Two, I love. Disney, I'm, I'm always, I've always been bullish on. And Warner, I love music, and I love the artists that are in that catalog. So just going over the, uh, just wanted to go back over the growth, growth stocks real quick. But anyways, guys, that will wrap up the portfolio for today. <clears throat> Let me know down below if there are any growth stocks that you would like to see me add. I'm not strictly just going for 30 stocks anymore. I'm okay with opening a couple more positions. As in I'm open. I want to own Tesla. I want to own Google. Um, <clears throat> I've actually looked into Lemonade as well, uh, the insurance company. And as, as I said before, I do want Airbnb. So I could own something like 25 uh, individual dividend-paying stocks, something like 15 um growth stocks as well. I'm not opposed to that. I'm just more focused on the dividend side than I am on the growth side. But who knows, eventually I could have, you know, 25 individual dividend paying stocks and something like 25 growth stocks as well, which it wouldn't bother me. So anyways, guys, that'll wrap up the portfolio I uh, review. I do want to say again, thank you so much for hitting 400 subscribers. Thank you to everybody who's commented, who's followed me on Instagram, who's left a comment. I'm very appreciative. And uh, I want to make sure you guys know that um, I'm just a random guy from Iowa sharing my investing journey. And the fact that I have 400 people that are following and excited about when I post and, you know, interact and just enjoy investing like I do, it really does make it worth it. So thank you guys so much for all the support. I'll see you tomorrow with another dividend investing video. Take care, guys.